The content presented in this video is not meant to replace the advice of your pediatrician and should not be used to inform treatment. The following is meant only to provide recommendations for newborn care. Please consult a pediatrician for medical treatment related to you and your newborn. Hello and welcome to the newborn education class. I'm Dr. Blair Hammond, a general pediatrician at Mount Sinai Hospital and co-founding director of the Mount Sinai Parenting Center. Our team at the Mount Sinai Parenting Center, made up of a developmental psychologist, social worker, and pediatricians, designed this class to give all parents more knowledge and confidence so they can go home a little less stressed and better able to care for their newborn. You will hear from lots of staff members here at Mount Sinai about common topics like feeding, burping, bathing, soothing, and healthy sleep. We will also discuss common medical questions, such as when you should call the doctor and what signs you should look for to know if your child might be sick. Lastly, something that is particularly important to the Mount Sinai Parenting Center, we will talk to you about what you as a parent can do to help your child's development, even at this young age of life. Throughout this video, whenever we say development, we're talking about the whole range of how your child grows as a person much more than just their physical body, but also their brain, emotions, and behaviors. It's amazing how much brain growth occurs in the newborn period. Science has shown us that there's over a million nerve connections made every second in a newborn's brain. And there's research showing how you can help your baby learn and develop important skills and relationships. The great news is you don't need any special toys. It's your face, your voice, your touch, and your back and forth interactions that do the most teaching. Let's start with how you can help your baby learn language. All babies in the newborn nursery will have their hearing checked before they go home. Most babies pass and hear really well. In fact, studies have shown that babies are born able to recognize their mother's voice. That means they can hear your voice as unique from others and that your voice can soothe, comfort and teach them like no one else's. Okay, baby, I'm gonna give you some milk now. This is your eyebrows, this is your eyes, this is your nose. Hi. Whatever your name is. Um, what is my baby's name again? I don't know. There's a specific way of talking to babies that has been shown to help them learn language best. It's called parentese. Parentese means using a high-pitched sing-song voice with real words and exaggerated facial expressions. This is not baby talk like gaga goo goo, which doesn't help to promote real language. Many of you may naturally use this voice with your babies already, like saying, Hello, sweet baby. Mama's so happy to see you. It may feel silly, but it's real science. Also, if you speak in a language you feel most comfortable with, usually your native language, then you can express yourself and your emotions better. Having multiple languages spoken in a home does not cause long-term language delay. Hearing lots of words now helps build a child's vocabulary later. A great way to make sure your baby's day is filled with words is to use sports casting, which means narrating and commenting on what you are doing moment by moment and saying the steps out loud. Almost like how someone would describe a soccer game on TV. So right now I'm putting you down, and I'm going to be super gentle with your little head. Oh, goodness, there you go. Talking to your baby during everyday activities, such as bathing, changing a diaper, or getting dressed, turns daily routines into opportunities for learning. Eyes, ears. We encourage you to label everything around your child, including things, people, and even emotions. For example, when you're changing a diaper, you can hold up the diaper and say, this is your diaper. Mama's changing your diaper. All right, Lulu, let's change your diaper. It can feel silly labeling simple objects, but when you do, you're really helping them learn language. You can also label emotions. For example, if your baby's crying during the sponge bath, you'd say, oh, you're crying. This makes you upset. I know, it's wet and cold, and that's no fun. By doing this, you're recognizing what your baby's trying to say to you and helping them learn how to label their own emotions as they grow. As you help your baby to understand the world around them, you want to try and practice what's called responsive or sensitive parenting. 
This means observing your baby, noticing and understanding their cues, and responding to them regularly and appropriately with love. There's a lot of evidence that sensitive parenting, back and forth talking, and close connection between a parent and their baby is fundamental to the baby's development and physical health. This type of parenting helps a baby feel that their needs are going to be met, that they're heard and seen and loved, and those feelings allow their brains to focus on all the new things they need to learn and understand. They get angry. Babies cry because they want to take a bath. It's not always obvious what babies are trying to say, and you're sometimes playing detective to figure out what that cry actually means. Getting to know each other takes time, but you're going to learn your baby's cues. As a parent, you'll become an expert on your child. In addition to crying, babies may also stare blankly when they're getting too tired, or look away if they've had too much stimulation. They may also become squirmy or arch their back when they're uncomfortable or upset. You'll spend a lot of time looking at your baby, and your face is their favorite toy. Babies see best up close, so times when you're feeding, bathing, or doing a diaper change are great opportunities for them to see your face clearly. They're watching and learning from your smile, your eyes, and the way your mouth moves while you speak. Let them see the delight you feel when you look at them. Touch can provide many benefits to your baby's growth, physically and emotionally. It is a myth that holding an infant will spoil them. As we mentioned before, responding to your baby by holding them and helping them calm down is so important. Being held, snuggled, and cuddled makes babies feel safe and secure, not spoiled. Placing your baby directly on your bare chest, skin to skin, is one of the best ways to introduce touch in these early days. In addition to soothing your baby, skin to skin can actually help with the baby's heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and even their blood sugar. If you're breastfeeding, skin to skin can also help with milk production. Although you're doing a lot of snuggling and touching during the day, it's also important to practice tummy time from the start to help your baby's strength and development. We recommend doing this when your baby is awake on a firm surface. Some babies may be fussy or cry during tummy time, so start out at a few seconds and build up to three to five minutes several times a day. Now, on to some common questions that newborn parents have about infant care. One, two, two, three. 10 or 20 by three, 10. 100. He likes a lot of milk. Feeding a newborn may seem like a full-time job. At birth, a newborn's stomach is about the size of a marble, so they don't take too much at one time, but they do need to feed frequently. At this age, feeding is on demand. That means that your baby leads the schedule. However, sleepy babies need to be woken up to feed every three to four hours. In general, newborn babies should feed eight to 12 times per day. Some signs that can suggest your baby is hungry are rooting, hands in the mouth, or crying. It may be difficult to figure out when your child is hungry because babies get fussy and like to suck for lots of reasons, but you'll get to know your baby's feeding cues over time. For breastfeeding babies, try feeding about 15 to 20 minutes per side each feed. The baby's frequent sucking during this time is important to stimulate milk production, which typically comes in within two to five days after birth. For the first few days, babies are mostly just getting colostrum, which is very nutritious for a baby. For formula-fed babies in the first day or two, they may need only up to 15 milliliters. That's half an ounce at each feed. The amount they take will slowly increase with each day. Once a baby goes home, they will on average have one to three ounces about every one to three hours. If you're doing a combination of breast milk and formula, try to do the breastfeeding first to stimulate milk production and then offer the formula supplement afterwards. You can talk with your doctors or nurses about how much to supplement depending on if there are any other issues specific to you or your baby. At this age, babies do not need water or cereal just breast milk or formula. 
Many parents ask, how do I know if my baby's getting enough milk? It's normal for babies to lose some weight in the first few days, up to 10% of birth weight. When you go home from the hospital, we usually recommend that you see the doctor in one to three days to check on the baby's weight. Babies should be back at their birth weight by two weeks of life. Monitoring wet diapers in addition to weight is a good way to assess if your baby is getting enough. There's an easy way to remember the number of diapers a newborn should have. At least one wet diaper on day one, two wet diapers on day two, at least three on day three, and four or more from day four onward. Usually babies will have approximately four to eight wet diapers a day moving forward. If your baby has fewer wet diapers than that or no wet diapers for more than eight to 10 hours at a time, you may need to increase feedings or supplement. When it comes to poop, there's a lot of variation. Your baby may poop every time they feed, poop once a day, turn red or strain while they poop, or even pass gas. This is all normal. We expect your baby to poop at least once in the first 24 hours of life. The first bowel movements are black, sticky, meconium poop. However, within a few days, stool will typically become looser, yellow, and seedy. No, no, not like that. Like this, very gently. <laughs> It is normal for babies to spit up. For some babies, burping can help them spit up less and possibly feed better. We recommend you try burping your baby in this newborn period. You may not get burps at this point, but we suggest burping your baby halfway through a feed and at the end of each feed. Common burping methods include holding the baby over your shoulder or holding the baby in a sitting position, supporting the neck and gently patting or rubbing the back. Try this for a couple of minutes. If you get a burp, great. If not, move on. Spitting up may occur when you are burping your baby or after a feeding when the baby is lying down. If the spit up is effortless in the color of the milk, we typically do not worry about it. Sometimes, spit up may even come out of the nose in addition to the mouth. That may seem alarming, but it is also okay. Remember, throughout feeding, burping, and spitting up, you can use your voice and touch to sports cast, label, and soothe your baby and show them a sensitive and loving response to their needs. Moving on from feeding issues to umbilical cord care, bathing, and diapering. The umbilical cord usually falls off between one to three weeks after birth. You do not need any alcohol or special lotions in that area. For one to two days before or after the cord separates, you may notice a small amount of blood and oozing. Ideally, you want to keep the umbilical cord area dry until the cord has fallen off. If you want to bathe the baby during this time, sponge baths are usually recommended until the cord has fallen off and are not required daily. Wipe the face. Is it no face? She has spit right here. Wash the neck. The neck. The neck. How frequently you bathe your baby is up to you. We're going to walk through how to do the sponge bath the first few weeks of life. Most important is safety. Make sure you have everything ready before you begin so you don't have to leave the baby alone. Use warm water for most of the bath and soap sparingly to not dry out the baby's skin. Avoid soaps with heavy perfumes or fragrances as they may cause skin irritation. As we mentioned earlier, bath time is an excellent time to sports cast what you are doing and have your face nice and close to your baby. Now we're actually gonna wash our baby. We're gonna go head to toe, saving that diaper area for last because it is the messiest. You can actually leave the baby's diaper on while you give them their bath to avoid any messes, which is what we're gonna do here. Take a little bowl of warm water and have the baby laying down on a towel. Then, using a washcloth, you start by washing the face, wiping over the eyes, explaining to your baby I'm just washing your eyes and your nose and cleaning behind your ears. Now I'm gonna find your neck and wipe in the neck area because all sorts of trap dribble and milk get in there. Doesn't feel nice. That feels nice. For the rest of the body, we can use a little bit of soap. So I have a separate bowl with soapy water. And we'll wash the rest of his body. Ready? We're gonna wash your hair. Doesn't feel nice. It feels nice, it's warm. 
Yeah. As you're wiping under the armpits and down the arms and hands, you can even count their fingers as you go along, talking to the baby throughout as you're doing the bath. Make sure to support the head well and turn the baby over to wash their back. All right, let's get your legs and your toes. There's five fingers and there's five toes on each foot. They match. Yeah, let me see this knee. Finally, take the diaper off and gently clean your baby as you would for a diaper change. Hmm, I don't know how to put this on. It's on backwards. He doesn't have any feet. I don't know how to put that on. You're nice and clean now. There are a wide variety of diapers available. Most disposable diapers have tabs on the back and an indicator strip on the front that changes from yellow to blue when the diaper gets wet. To fasten the diaper, place the tabs from back to front and pull the two tabs gently to the front of the diaper. It should fit snugly, but not too tight. We often fold the diaper under the umbilical cord so that it does not irritate your baby's skin. If you do decide to use baby wipes after discharge from the hospital, just like for soap, Try to avoid anything with perfume. While it may smell really pretty, it can be a sign of irritating chemicals. There's no need to use any diaper cream for routine diaper changes. If your baby develops a diaper rash, you can use a white zinc oxide cream that creates a barrier over the skin so that urine and poop will not irritate the skin. Hi, I'm gonna change your diaper, you okay? So first things first, we're gonna take off the icky one. Remember to talk to your baby throughout all daytime diaper changes and use all that face-to-face -face time to help stimulate your baby's brain and language development. For babies who have been circumcised, we recommend that you keep the tip of the penis well lubricated with petroleum jelly so that the healing skin does not get stuck to the diaper. You can apply this directly to the tip of the penis or to a piece of gauze and place that over the penis. Do this with each diaper change for one week. For uncircumcised penises, do not force the foreskin back. It will naturally separate when the child is older. It is normal for female genitalia to be slightly enlarged and red after birth. There may also be white discharge or even a little blood from the vaginal area. All of these are related to hormones from the mother and should resolve with time. When you're doing a diaper change, you do not need to try and remove all of the white discharge from the vaginal area. But when your baby has pooped, you should gently spread apart the folds and clean out any poop from front to back. This is how you walk a baby to sleep. He's about to wake up. Uh oh. Thinking about safe sleep and healthy sleep habits is an important part of your role as a parent. Let's begin with safety and what you can do to reduce the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, also known as SIDS. The highest risk of SIDS is between four weeks and four months, but there is risk for the entire first year. We do not know exactly what causes SIDS, but there have been many studies looking at what decreases the risk of SIDS. The recommendations include placing babies on their backs to sleep, having babies sleep in their own space like a crib or a bassinet with a firm mattress and fitted sheets, and having no loose blankets, pillows, stuffed animals, or sleep positioners in the crib. Please note that car seats, swings, bouncers, and strollers are not safe sleep places and should not be a substitute for cribs or bassinets. Ideally, babies should sleep in the same room, but not the same bed as a parent. Having a smoke-free environment, using a pacifier, and avoiding overheating have also been shown to decrease the rate of SIDS. In addition to safe sleep, we want to talk about developing healthy sleep habits. In the first few weeks of life, your baby will not usually have long stretches of sleep. But some babies are sleepier, and I want to remind you to wake your baby every three hours to feed until your baby regains birth weight. Usually this happens the first two to three weeks of life. 
At night, you may be able to stretch out feeds once your baby is gaining well. Newborns may not be able to tell the difference between day and night and may actually be more awake at night than during the day. To help, during the daytime, try to make feedings and diaper changes more stimulating by talking and making eye contact and giving your baby lots of exposure to light. Your baby's longest stretch of sleep should be at night, so wake your baby if their daytime nap is lasting more than three hours. At nighttime, everything should be quieter with dimmer lights, less talking, and less eye contact. Feedings are brief and boring, and diaper changes are less engaging. Now, some people may think that if they keep the baby up all day, their baby will be really tired and sleepy at night, but that doesn't work. A tired baby is much more likely to be a fussy baby and have difficulty calming their body down and going to sleep. Give your baby an opportunity to sleep every one and a half to two hours after being awake. Your goal should be to work towards putting your baby down to sleep awake, but in a drowsy state. As your baby gets older, try not to have the baby fall fully asleep on you, or while feeding, or while in motion. If your baby is in a drowsy, sort of dreamlike state, but still awake, they can begin to put themselves to sleep on their own. Then, if the baby stirs and wakes themselves up, as many babies will do just by startling themselves with a snort, they can think, oh, this is where I fell asleep, and will be more likely to be able to calm themselves down to go back to sleep in that space without needing you. You may hear about sleep training. Around or after four months of life, some parents will decide to sleep train, but here we're talking about good sleep habits and want to emphasize that your baby is too young to be ignored when they're crying at night. Babies at this young age need your help to calm their bodies down because their brains aren't ready to calm themselves down just yet. This doesn't mean you have to go to them with every sound. Sometimes they're just fussing a little. But if you notice that they're about to really cry, you're better off soothing them before they get themselves too worked up. Even though your baby may be waking up many times throughout the night, it's helpful to establish a bedtime between 6 and 8 p.m. A bedtime routine may include bath, breast, bottle, maybe some rocking or singing, really whatever works for you. Doing the same thing before bed each night, even when your baby isn't sleeping for more than a few hours at a time, will help signal to them that it's bedtime and they will grow to love and look forward to that time together. Look, hi, Bella. It's okay, lovey. In the window, the cradle will drop. That looking glass break, Mama's gonna buy you a... Crying is one of the ways babies communicate to us their wants. Whether they're hungry or wet, uncomfortable, too hot, too cold, tired, sick, or just unhappy. Sometimes your baby has been fed, changed, is not hot or sick, is in your arms, and is still crying. Keep in mind that if your baby has a witching hour and gets fussy around 5.30 or so, this may just mean it's bedtime. Between three to eight weeks of life, many babies become more fussy, with peak fussiness around six weeks. All babies need help calming their bodies during this time. However, some babies cry more than others and are more difficult to soothe. We refer to this as colic if a healthy, well-fed infant cries for more than three hours per day, more than three days a week, for more than three weeks in a row. Typically, colic begins around three weeks of life and the crying is more common in the evening hours. The way a baby seems to move and cry often gives the appearance of stomach discomfort, but no exact cause of colic has been identified. If your physician thinks your baby has colic, you can discuss ways to help soothe your baby safely as this can be a frustrating and challenging experience for many parents. This is how you swaddle. That's tight enough. <laughs> now his head's sticking out. Here are a few things that often help calm a baby. Let's start with swaddling. 
Let's quickly review how to swaddle. If you are using a regular blanket or a swaddle from the hospital, start by laying it out flat. Fold down the top corner and center the baby's body with the shoulders right along the top. Then take one corner and pull it across over the shoulder and tuck it down behind the back, keeping the arm down. Pull the bottom corner and tuck that also behind the shoulder. Finally, take the last corner and pull that around the baby and tuck it behind the back. Be sure to keep the blanket loose around the legs, but snug around the chest. Swaddling should be used for infants under two months of age. Many babies are also soothed by sucking on a pacifier, your finger, or their own hands. Pacifiers are fine to use for soothing and sleep once breastfeeding has been well established. Never tie pacifiers to the crib or around your child's neck or hand. At six months of age, you may want to limit pacifier use to the crib so that it doesn't interfere with your baby's attempt to babble and communicate. Many babies will also settle down when they hear white noise. This can come from you saying, shh, close to their ear, a white noise machine, an app on your phone, or a household sound like a vacuum. Many babies like a little bit of movement such as standing up, bouncing, gentle rocking, swaying, or a light swinging motion. You're going to become an expert soother of your baby, but it isn't easy. If you feel overwhelmed, upset, or angry, it's okay to put a crying baby in a safe place like a crib and give yourself a break for a few minutes. Call a friend or a family member, pour a cup of tea, and then come back. You can always also call your baby's doctor and let them know that you're overwhelmed. They can help you with other strategies to help soothe your baby. We want to be clear that it is essential that you never shake your baby, as forcefully shaking a baby can cause damage to the brain. In addition to babies crying, it is very common for parents to cry. The arrival of a baby is like no other experience in life. There are a lot of new demands, hormonal changes, and less sleep. Around 50 to 80% of mothers will experience something called baby blues in the first one to three weeks after giving birth. Symptoms of baby blues include mood swings with intense feelings of sadness, crying, or feeling irritable or overwhelmed, followed by feelings of joy and love for your baby moments later. These feelings typically come and go and generally do not significantly affect your ability to care for your baby or yourself. Baby blues will typically resolve within two to three weeks. Getting outside each day, talking about your feelings, and asking for support in caring for your baby can be very helpful for anyone experiencing baby blues. However, if you're feeling sad, down, anxious, or very worried for most of the day, or for many days in a row, or if you're suddenly feeling uninterested in things you're normally interested in or have difficulty caring for yourself or your baby, these can be symptoms of more serious condition called postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. These symptoms can be similar to baby blues, but are more severe, last most of the day, and continue beyond the first couple of weeks. It is important to discuss any symptoms related to your mood that you may be experiencing with your healthcare provider, either your OB or your child's doctor. We want to make sure that you get the help that you need, not only so you can be well, but so that your baby can thrive. Symptoms of postpartum depression and anxiety are not a sign of weakness or failure. They are treatable medical conditions that if left untreated can have a long-term impact on both you and your child's health. For further information, contact Postpartum Support International at 1-800-944-4773. In a crisis or emergency situation, call your health care provider or go to the nearest emergency room. We're going to end this class going over your baby from head to toe so you understand what's normal. If you look at the top of your baby's head, Often you can feel a soft spot called the anterior fontanelle. This is normal on babies. You may also notice the ridges of the skull bones. That's normal too. Their head may seem to have little lumps or bumps or be funny shaped due to delivery. These swellings will usually resolve in the first 24 to 48 hours. To help your baby develop a nice round back of the head, we encourage you to do tummy time and hold the baby in different positions throughout the day. On to the baby's eyes. 
As we mentioned before, their vision is not well developed at this age. Babies can see at 20 feet what an adult with good vision can see at 200 feet. Also, their eyes may cross, and that's normal. The eyes should be consistently moving together by the time the baby is three or four months of life. You may also notice some mild crusting around your baby's eyes or lashes. Sometimes tears don't drain well from the eyes of newborns because of a blocked tear duct. You can use a clean cloth with warm water to wipe their eyes as needed. Now moving on to the nose and mouth. The nostrils on babies are small. Babies can sound congested or snorty. It is common for babies to sneeze. Sneezing does not mean your newborn has a cold or allergies. If you see mucus in the nose, you may gently use a nasal aspirator to remove the mucus. However, if you don't see any mucus, you don't need to do anything. It's also common for babies to hiccup, <laughs> sigh, and intermittently make grunting noises, especially when sleeping or after they've eaten. Babies' breathing is a little different than adults. If you look at the chest area, you may notice babies often breathe faster than you do and not at a consistent rate. This is called periodic breathing of the newborn. They may have a few fast panting breaths, then take a sighing breath, and then breathe normally again. This is very common in newborns. There are many things that you may notice about your infant's skin. First of all, it is normal for babies to have dry, peeling skin. We expect babies to begin to shed that outer layer of skin right away. No special creams or lotions are needed. If the cracking is deep, you can moisturize the skin to prevent further cracking and bleeding. But again, try to avoid using products with fragrance or perfume. Most of these skin issues are normal and will just go away on their own. However, always point out any rash or skin finding to your doctor to be sure they're aware of it and let your doctor know immediately if your baby has a rash along with a fever or any other symptoms of illness. Finally, baby skin may also appear slightly yellow in the first few days of life. This is called jaundice and is very common in newborns. In the hospital, the baby's monitored for jaundice, but if you notice that your baby looks more yellow when you're home, call your doctor. It can be normal for your baby's hands and feet to sometimes look bluish in the first few weeks of life if they get a little cold. This is normal and should resolve with gentle warming through touch or adding layers of clothing if needed. Some babies will also have long nails and will scratch their face. If your baby does scratch themselves, those scratches will heal just fine. For now, we recommend just covering the hands with little mittens, socks, or a shirt that can be pulled over the hands to cover the nails like we have in the hospital. It can be difficult to cut or file the nails without accidentally cutting the skin around the nails at this age. In about one to two weeks, the nails will start to separate from the skin of the finger and filing or clipping of the nails is possible. Now, we've discussed the basics about your baby's body from head to toenail. Let's discuss how we can keep your baby from getting sick. Newborns are more susceptible to illnesses in the first few months of life. The most important precaution you can take is having everyone around you wash their hands or use hand sanitizer before holding your baby. Breastfeeding can also help protect a baby from infections. Encourage siblings or other young children to kiss the feet instead of the face of the baby and try to keep sick people away from your baby. Caregivers should be vaccinated against whooping cough and the flu. The cold weather does not cause your baby to get a cold, but you should dress your child appropriately for the weather conditions. In general, a baby should wear typically one more layer of clothing than you have on. You can check the baby's nose, feet, and back of their neck to see if they are too hot or too cold. While we take your baby's temperature regularly in the hospital, you don't need to take it daily at home. If your baby feels warm or is acting really fussy or seems off, then you may take the baby's temperature. If your baby has a rectal temperature of 100.4 or higher in the first two months of life, call your doctor and have the baby seen right away. To take a rectal temperature, lubricate the tip of a digital thermometer, turn it on, and insert so that only the full metal tip is in the rectum. Let's now review some reasons to call your doctor. If your baby is not having enough wet diapers in 24 hours, if the baby has blood in the stool, if the baby has green or projectile vomit, 
you should call your doctor immediately. You should also call the doctor if your baby seems to be working hard to breathe, using extra chest muscles, or if the baby has a bluish color of the chest or mouth area, or you notice increased yellow jaundice color. As we just mentioned, if the baby has a temperature of 100.4 or greater, or if your baby has fussiness or crying that you are unable to soothe, you should call your doctor right away. Additional reasons to call include if your baby is extremely difficult to wake, floppy, or unresponsive. Of course, if you're ever worried about your baby, call your doctor. Your pediatrician is there to guide you through this time. As we end our time together, we want to remind you that you and your baby are both learning so much at this age. Your baby is learning from their relationship with you and back and forth moments together. Recognizing your baby's cues and responding with warmth and consistency are the best ways to help your baby's development and their brain grow. Remember, you are your baby's favorite toy. It is your voice, your face, your touch that teaches your baby best. So snuggle up, talk lots, and do some skin to skin. You have what it takes to do this job well, but it's perfectly natural if you second guess yourself or feel nervous. You're brand new at this too. As healthcare professionals, we're your partners on this parenting journey, and we'll be here to help guide and support you whenever you need us. For more information on what you've seen today, and for additional answers to commonly asked questions, visit the Mount Sinai Parenting Center website at mountsinaiparenting.org or healthykids.org.